Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Well, I've been um, having some Achilles tendon issues and uh, haven't been able to run for a little while. So under normal circumstances, that would lead to me losing my goddamn mind. But coincidentally, um, six days ago, I was on Twitter and I came across uh, the feed of Matthew Reese, the guy who played Philip in The Americans, which is one of my all time favorite shows. And um, he had just started doing this 25 push-ups a day for 30 days challenge to raise awareness for men's mental health issues. And I thought, huh, I haven't done push-ups in my life. I should give this a shot and see how it works out over 30 days. Um, it was not easy for the first couple. We're on day six now. I will get back to running in a couple of days, but um, I now can do 25 push-ups in a single set, which I, I could not do six days ago. It took till day five for me to pull that one off. But every day was a an improvement, even though for the first two or three days, I was just incredibly sore from trying to get to even 15, 18, 20. Um, but, you know, if there's one thing the, um, the podcast has taught me, as well as my running journey for the last couple of years, you know, you, you stick with it, you don't bail or make excuses. And, um, you get better at stuff over time, which is also going to be part of the point of this uh, the show's conversation. And my guest for this episode is the cartoonist Adrian Tomina, who has a new book out today, uh, July 21st, 2020, for you time travelers out there. Uh, it's called The Loneliness of the Long Distance Cartoonist. It's from his longtime publisher, Drawn and Quarterly. So The Loneliness of the Long Distance Cartoonist, we'll just call it the book uh, for now, um, is a... 160 page autobiographical comic about Adrian's life in comics, except instead of focusing on the highlights, it is a series of episodes about the embarrassments and humiliations he's suffered that are comics related, starting from when he was an eight year old getting laughed at in school for his his comic book readership. Um, in the spirit of the best cringe comedy, uh, most of the episodes are hysterically funny, you know, as as long as they're not, not happening to you. Uh, and some of those things did happen to me. Now, I'll admit, there was a stretch during the book where I, I started to wonder about the self-flagellation and, and the point of chronicling so many of these moments without depicting much of the, the the positive stuff and and the good uh, feeling that is his work evoked in him but the book comes around to explore that too um in a way that redeems it and adrian's lifelong goal slash career and that ties into that issue of sticking with something and getting better at it over time and what that means um and, and what it brings you in that respect, it's a really thoughtful book, and it's 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 drawn in a style that's much looser and less worked over than some of Adrian's recent work, in a way that I found much more engaging. And we talk about it in, in relation to the great cartoonist Seth, how you um, artists need to find a new style to refresh themselves, and um, both of these guys, I, I think, might be moving. Well, I know Seth has already moved in this this direction through the the much looser work he's done in in recent years, 
And I, I think, well, I hope uh, this book, you know, signals another phase in Adrian's career, too, where he can explore things a little differently than he had in some of his other work. Um, either way, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Cartoonist is a, a wonderful read. Um, yes, you'll laugh, et cetera. You might cringe a lot. One of the things that I love about it also is how it's all arranged chronologically and a chunk of it documents this era of cartooning that I loved during the, during the nineties and into the aughts as Adrian's career is taking off. And trust me, I was around when his first, not his very first, but one of his early uh, issues of optic nerve, the mini comic he was putting out, uh, came out. I remember buying those, um, when I was in grad school. So 93, 94, 95, um, there are some episodes within the book uh, where Adrian's interacting with some of his friends, including this great one with Dan Klaus and the late Richard Sala. And near the end of the episode, I, I asked Richard, I asked Adrian about Richard and um, we lost Richard a few months ago and I never got to meet him, but I, I uh, corresponded with him just a little bit. But the part where Adrian talks about him is, is one of the favorite things I've ever recorded for this show. So I hope you stick around for it. Now, as caveats go, uh, not a lot. Adrian had a fan on throughout the episode, so I filtered that out, which makes his voice slightly metallic and echoey. But, but that's it. Now, here's Adrian's bio. Adrian Tomino was born in 1974 in Sacramento, California. He began self-publishing his comic book series, Optic Nerve, when he was 16, and in 1994, he received an offer to publish from Drawn and Quarterly. His comics have been anthologized in McSweeney's, Best American Comics, and Best American Non-Required Reading, and his graphic novel, Shortcomings, was a New York Times notable book. His previous book, Killing and Dying, appeared on numerous best-of lists and was a New York Times graphic bestseller. Since 1999, he has been a regular contributor to The New Yorker. He lives in Brooklyn with his wife and daughters. His new graphic memoir is The Loneliness of the Long Distance Cartoonist. And now, the virtual memories conversation with Adrian Tomina. Where'd the, this book come from for you? It it feels very different than your short story work, as well as some of the long form stuff. Tell me where it began and, and how it evolved over the course of, of writing and drawing. Right. Well, I think in one way or another, I've been planning for this book for a very long time, um, you know, going back to, to some of the earliest incidents that are described in the book. Um I wasn't sure exactly when I would use that material or how I would use it, but it was percolating in my brain for a long time. And when I finished my previous book, which is called Killing and Dying, I had this strong urge to just do something that was slightly reactive, at least within the, in the realm of, of, of my capacity. Uh, so Killing and Dying was fiction. It was short stories. It was mostly in fairly somber tone. Uh, it was in color. Um, it was a very professional and slick looking book in a lot of ways. And so I wanted to do something both for myself and for my audience that was a departure from that in some way. And so uh, with that in mind, I kind of reconnected to the thoughts that I'd had for years about doing this autobiographical book and it seemed like a, a good match now when, when you say planning over time do you mean you went out of your way to get embarrassed and humiliated no, by no, comics no, 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 over, no. over the years or, okay. <laughs> no that's come up a lot i think because of social media and because now there's such a culture of staging things for the sake of social media that uh, a lot of questions have come up about you know how much i orchestrated some of these things and i thought you know if i had the power to orchestrate some of these things, I, I definitely would have used it in, in different ways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but how did it evolve from when you, you started it and from what you were contemplating uh, at the beginning to, to what this book became over time, or is it pretty much, you know, as fully formed as a, 
as the end product. No, no. For for a long time, uh, the idea was just to have um, an endless series of of the kind of anecdotes that make up the first two thirds or three fourths of the book, which is just kind of very straightforward, I guess, comedic depictions of the trials and tribulations that I've lived through as a cartoonist and as a comic book fan. Um, and as I was thinking about that, uh, I had the experience that is depicted in the last portion of the book. Uh, and while I was actually going through that experience, the, the, the idea of, of fusing that experience with the original idea for the book just kind of crystallized in my, in my mind at that moment. Mm -hmm. And the book begins when you were eight years old, but you were already too far gone. Do you remember your, your earliest comics memory? Or do you have an earliest? Well, the, the, that wasn't humiliating. That's just <laughs> the, er, the earliest memory I have of comics is, uh, the, uh, the paperback collections of the peanuts comic strip. Um, we had a ton of those in the house when I was growing up. And, um, those are the first, the earliest memories I have of comics and of books, I, I, you know, of art, uh, all those things. It's really kind of a, a, a crucial, a crucial piece of, of culture for me. Um, and then I think second after that would be the Spider-Man comics of the mid to late seventies that were also being brought into the house by my older brother. Mm -hmm. And have you forgiven him for, you know, turning you on to comics? <laughs> well, he, he got out, <laughs> he, he got me hooked and then, and then, and then got out. Um, Bailed. Yeah. He, he kind of became the opposite. He's like a, a an outdoorsman and uh, you know, just kind of the opposite of, of a, of a cartoonist in every, in every way. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I, no, no hard feelings, but uh, yeah, he definitely, <laughs> he definitely set me on a path and, and then, and then figured out a, a better life for himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the, I'd say, interesting aspects of the book, but beyond the the notebook design, which I totally appreciate because that's the exact size and shape of graph pad that I used in the before time to take all of my podcast notes, uh, uh, a five right. uh, uh, grid pad that the moment I opened it, I was like, oh, Adrian and I have something in common right. besides age and the, the uh, Gen X pseudo profundity that you get accused of at <laughs> one point in the book. Uh, <laughs> but the, the sense of a visual style developing over the course of the book, as well as how that reflects, you know, you growing into a style over the course of your career. Did you find that? Um, I guess, when did you find yourself yourself I'm, in I'm, terms of drawing and storytelling? I'm still searching as far as I know. I think um, that's been one of the ongoing struggles of, of my, of my career, uh, going back to, to my teenage years. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with not having any kind of formal training. I didn't have any art training. I didn't have any, certainly didn't have any cartooning training, uh, in any formal way. And the way I learned how to do it was by reading work that appealed to me and trying to copy it. Um, and so that's led to a very long path of kind of influences popping up and receding a little bit and hopefully getting integrated. Um, and so for all those years, one of the main questions in my mind is what is my own style? Um, what, what isn't just like, um, a hodgepodge of, of things that I've borrowed from, from my heroes. Um, and I think that's, a question that's occurred to a lot of my critics too. Um, and with this book, it felt like a great opportunity to uh, probe that and sort of challenge myself to investigate that. Um, and one of the things I tried to do was to uh, clear my mind of the idea of, of style and, and to, to try and as best I could find a mode of making comics that was the equivalent of handwriting. In other words, when you're 
writing a check. You're not thinking of how, how am I going to craft each letter? What should it look like? Um, you're doing it in a way that is just natural to your body and yet still clearly communicates the information that it needs to. And um, that was really what I was aiming for with this book. Um, and working in that sketchbook style and forcing myself to work quickly also helped too. There was less time to agonize about how do I draw these clouds? Well, let me go look how Jaime Hernandez drew clouds. And let me think about how did Dan Klaus draw clouds and, and things like that. And I just had to get a page done per day. That was, that was the pace, was to, to start with a, an empty page each morning and, and be done with it by, by the time I went to bed. You know, how was the work process for that different than some of your, your previous ones? Uh, it's totally different. Um, and that was by design. I, I, uh, I, it's hard to say, but I actually spent seven years working on my previous book. And um, when it was finished, I had the thought of, I, I, I might not want to make comics at all anymore. And if I do, I certainly don't want to do it in that exact same process. Uh, at least for now, um, I don't want to spend a week on a page of comics. Um, and so, um, yeah, that was, it was, uh, a conscious decision to, to, to work faster, um, to, I mean, one of the things that I think other cartoonists will probably tell you about it is that sometimes we'll do a rough draft of a comics page and it'll perfectly communicate the story and it'll have like a liveliness to it and it just won't look really polished. And then when we try and translate that to the finished art, it sometimes loses some of the liveliness and at best just is communicative to the same degree that the, the rough one was. Um, and so I was trying to tap into that a little bit and find some balance between what felt expressive and expeditious, but also look presentable, at least. Sure. And it, it does seem more refined, but it struck me a little similar to not saying that you're ripping someone off because I know you're sensitive about that <laughs> based on the book. Um, the way Seth has gone with mm -hmm. the memoir comics, working in, in marker nowadays, mm -hmm. the idea that someone who had such a controlled style and had that 1940s New York, 40s and 50s New Yorker thing down, just had to break away from how that all worked and, and found, you know, another mode that gets across what he wants to get across, but isn't this, this laborious thing. And then, you know, doing rubber stamp comics sure. also just sure. finding ways of doing this stuff without um, the, the, the same, I guess, time constraints and just limitations, I suppose, of, it, of the existing style. Yeah. I mean, I think this, this struggle that I'm describing is, is, is common to a lot of, a lot of my peers and, and certainly some of Seth's experiments in that way were, were inspirational to me. Um, because I, one of the stories that he's working on now in that mode is an autobiographical thing called um, Nothing Lasts. And I actually think yeah. that might be his best work. And so there was a part of me that thought, it's interesting that I'm responding to this maybe even more than I would have if it was done in his beautifully polished style. Um, that was a real... Uh, Kind of light bulb over my head that 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 something about the roughness of it was actually drawing me deeper into it um and i had a similar experience um years ago when uh, a cartoonist named jeffrey brown showed up uh on the scene and was doing sketch sketchbook comics with a with a ballpoint pen um and they were totally engaging and, and they they told the story well and um you know when that happened, I was in the middle of, I think, working on my book, Shortcomings, which was taking me at least a page a week. And I was mathematically figuring out the three-point perspective in every background and taking reference photos for every single car that showed up. And, and so I was, I was very envious of, of, of his way of working back then. So would you say essentially it's a, a case of self-confidence now, a, a sense that, you know, you are who you are as an artist? Or at least that you aren't as tied to um, that need for for hyper hyper realism in terms of what you're representing. Well, I think uh, you know the the more I, I work on comics and the more I read comics, I find that 
Um, and I, this is nothing new for me to say, but I think that there's sort of a paradox in terms of uh, the relationship between how realistic and detailed the artwork is and how realistic and believable and lifelike it feels as a reader. So, hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of cartoonists who work off photos and use tons of uh, Photoshop to, to, to model the colors and, and um, have just this kind of extreme level of detail. Um, and to me, none of those works approach the level of humanity of something like Peanuts, which is kind of the opposite stylistically. Um, so that has been on my mind a lot, uh, just in general, uh, especially with this book. And I think it also helps that I've had this sort of a uh, parallel career as an illustrator um, where, uh, you know, I, if I was only making comics, I would think, well, I really got to show the world that I know how to draw because this is the only way they're going to see my artwork. And, you know, I'd have a lot of, a lot more hand wringing in that regard. But mm -hmm. if I can take a break from comics and work on a cover for the New Yorker and really just draw the hell out of it and figure out the perspective and, the clothing folds and light and color and all these things in a way that kind of gets it out of my system. And when I get back to working on my comics, I feel like I can focus more on the essentials of storytelling. Do you feel th this is one of the Gil Roth theories of, of podcast guests. Um, when I re started recording with illustrators like John Cuneo, Joe Chardello, Barry Blitt, I found that amazingly they were more neurotic than most cartoonists I'd, mm. I'd recorded with. And my makeshift theory for it was because they have a lot more exposure and therefore they're more worried about, you know, oh my God, everybody sees this New Yorker mm -hmm. cover. They're going to tear me to pieces mm -hmm. as opposed to I did a comic for 3000 people, you know, who actually like me. Um, yeah. I mean, do you the, feel the any other, sense of, yeah, one versus the other? Well, the other, the other, side of that theory is that, um, and I can say this as both an illustrator and a cartoonist, is that illustrators, I don't think, get as much of a, a venue for truly expressing themselves. I think um, by nature of their job, they're working in service of a boss, uh, an editor or an art director. Um, their goal is to fulfill an assignment and meet a deadline. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of those aspects of that job um, can sometimes be antithetical to the, the, the pure expression that is afforded by uh, comics. Sure. Yeah. And they also told me I had a bad sample set of illustrators mm -hmm. to start off with. Uh, they sent me to Mark Ulrichson in San Francisco, most settled down normal guy in, in mm -hmm. the world who just happens to be a great illustrator. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it turns out I was I was just starting off on a, a bad foot with those. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned earlier the, well, the, the notion of peers. And I was wondering when you when you saw yourself in that that continuum of artists with the, well, with the people who influenced you, that moment that you felt welcome at the table. Mm -hmm. Do you recall that, uh, um, that, that, that sense of, holy shit, I belong? You know? No, I mean, I mean, I think the, for a long time I had uh, a sense of, holy shit, they're accepting me and they're allowing me to be here. But uh, I, I don't know if I've ever arrived at that moment of, of feeling like I belong. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, the, the, all all these people that I'm talking about, these friends of mine now who were previously artistic heroes of mine, uh, were, for whatever reason, just extraordinarily generous and, and inviting and, and welcoming to me when I was basically a, a dumb teenager who uh, had put out a few mini comics. Um, you know, I'll always be grateful for that and I'll always be confounded by why they did it, to be honest. Um, and, you know, it's been, in, in some of those cases, it's been 25 years or something like that. And I'll still get together with some of these people. And it's hard to shake that uh, inner fanboy. Yeah, Roz Chas told me she still has that over, of all people, Bruce McCall. Mm-hmm. 
that's her, oh my God, yeah. I'm at dinner with Bruce McCall. And I'm like, <laughs> Ross, okay, that's, that's your, your heroic meltdown yeah. thing. But um, have you found yourself in their position over the course of your career of, of being approached by younger artists and storytellers and, uh, you know, having to, to be as charitable as, as some of the guys yeah. were to you? I don't think that any things changed. I don't think anybody yeah. looks up to me in the way that I looked up to my heroes. I mean, um, <laughs> I think the world has. Oh yes, that new book you put out. I forgot. <laughs> I think the world has changed, and and what's changed is uh, you know younger cartoonists uh, are very excited by the work that their peers are doing, and um, you know maybe even artists younger than themselves, but. Um, no, I've, I, I don't ever recall being in the position that I put Dan Klaus or, or Seth or, or any of these people in by, by, you know, first pestering them through the mail with fan letters and coming to signings and, you know, eventually becoming friends, but constantly steering the conversation back to uh, obscure references in their work. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I would love to, to have that opportunity to sort of um, carry on the tradition. But, uh, you know, for, for better or worse, I, I don't think I'm, I'm the hero to anyone as I was to as, as those guys were to me. Anyone show up with tattoos of your uh, your drawings? Oh, yeah, that, that's that's been happening for a okay. while. And it's uh, it's always awkward because I, I I'm flattered, very flattered. You want to fix it? Well, no, no. I'm 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 flattered and uh um and I know they want me to be enthusiastic too, but um there's a part of me that that feels apologetic because I, I have a, a vision of them <laughs> coming to their senses uh five years later and thinking, Oh, why did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> well they can go to Graham Chaffee and he can fix it and turn it into something else. I Maybe guess, so. Maybe so. Keeping the comics thing going, but um yeah, along those lines, when you when you talk about or when we talk about that that continuity from the Klaus Hernandez's et cetera into the the present day, do you see yourself in a a sort of bridge role? I, I think a little of like Paul Mavridis being like the first post Zap guy mm -hmm. and kind of bridging into the seventies, and then you get Bill Griffith and these other guys coming in. Um, do you, I, think, I, I think of like. Guys That's like you first... and Tom Hart and John Lewis. And, oh, yeah. I think this is the first time I've ever been compared to Paul Mavridis. This is a, gr a groundbreaking moment. <laughs> <laughs> he was one of my fave, absolutely off the wall podcasts to do. But uh. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, but again, like just that, that era in which you came up, because I remember buying uh, the, the mini comics of Optic Nerve, I guess, 94, mm -hmm. 95, which yeah. would have been you know, after, after Ware has already made his splash um before you get a, a late 90s wave and did you know did you see yourself as part of a a cohort like that or you know in any sort of you know we're the next I, next generation i have always i mean if someone were to tell me that that's the role i played for them then i'd be i'd be honored but i i uh i've always sort of felt like this um this appendage or this this afterthought to the previous generation, um, you know, almost like a, a family that has the first cluster of kids. And then there's the one that shows up 15 years later or something like that. <laughs> um, uh, so, I mean, it, it's possible, it's possible that, that I've, I've, you know, filled that role in, in, in chronology. Uh, but, um, I feel very connected to, to, that that era of cartooning that I I grew up with, mm -hmm. and certainly, I mean, Mavridis was working with Gil Shelton. You know, that was being part of that scene, but also you know helping extend it in time. I think of the I think the first time we met uh, was SPX in 2012. I was just starting the podcast, and Tom Spurgeon called me. Uh, while I was back up in my room. Said, "Oh, come on downstairs to the bar. We're all hanging out." And it was Klaus, I think the bros, where you, Tom and Eric Reynolds. And I was just hiding behind <laughs> uh, Tom, just like, uh, I don't belong here. Nobody right. should, you know, ask why I'm here. So Coriac sat down next to me and we became 
fast friends right after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But it did strike me in that that instance, a bunch of young cartoonists came walking in, walked right past the table. Yeah. Didn't even notice who was sure, sitting there. Sure. And I thought, this is Mount Rushmore, guys. And, uh, you know, you're just kind of <laughs> not to forgetting them. everybody who helped. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's what kills me. Yeah. That sense of continuity, I guess. So, um, actually, have you ever taught or have you always, have you just, you know, made it through comics and illustration so uh, far uh, without a little to, bit, uh, a little bit. I've, um, yeah. I occasionally get, I, I've never taught like a full course. Um, I've been asked to, to show up for a day at, at some, at some schools and to talk to, to classes. Um, Oh, and the great but scene in I, the nursery school uh, or in the little kids uh, uh, scenario in the book. I, I forgot. About that. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, there's there's there, there's another scene related to that that I that I didn't put in the book. But when I was in college, I took a summer job uh, supposedly teaching comics to little kids. Um, and uh, I thought, well, it's my first teaching job. So let me put on my uh, my sports coat and my tie and uh, prepare my lesson plan. <laughs> and I get to the, the summer school and it's kind of like a, a fun hippie summer camp where teachers are wearing cut off jeans and playing around with a hacky sack and, and, you know, of course being called by their first name after I'd asked to be called Mr. Tomina. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and it, it, it went, it went poorly. I remember giving the, the assignment to, uh, invent your own characters, to do it, to do a page of comics using characters that you invented. And one kid did just, uh, obviously a, a teenage mutant Ninja Turtles story. And, uh, I'll, I, I cringe to even remember this, but I went over and I said, I hope your name is either Kevin Eastman or Peter Laird, because I said that you need to draw the characters that you created. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being a dick, even at that age. That's right. Kids, <laughs> That's right. Oh, man. I remember, well, uh, I went to college near Northampton, so Eastman and Laird were local heroes, which was mm -hmm. a a weird world in which to live at mm -hmm. like 19, 20, 21 years old, but uh, you know, another planet. Do you wish you'd, um, do you wish there was a CCS when you were young? Do you wish you'd been able to, to study comics and illustration uh, or, and, a, and drawing? Yeah. It's such a, it's such a tough question. I mean, I, I would love to be able to see some sort of uh, parallel universe type scenario where I got to live that life. Um, and, and I don't, I don't really, I don't pine for that. I don't, I don't, you know, um, it's not on my mind, but I, I wonder what, what impact it would have on me because I feel like I, uh, arrived at this point in my life through a very specific personal process of, of, of learning things on my own and, and stumbling upon, uh, kind of unwitting mentors, um, who I learned a lot from. Um, but it definitely wasn't a, uh, an academic experience at all. And I, I, I just, I'm not sure how that would have affected me. Um, I'm sure I would have enjoyed it. Uh, when I graduated high school, since there was no equivalent of that, my biggest dream was to move to New York and go to an art school. I didn't even know which art school. I just thought I want to live in New York and I want to be in an art school. And then I got accepted to Berkeley and, uh, my parents said, well, I think that decision has been made for, you know. <laughs> yeah. Do you have more comics slash art slash publishing friends than people outside that space? Non-combatants, I'll call them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. No, probably not. Um, mainly because uh, as a parent, um, my life has really opened up in ways that, that I probably wouldn't have sought out, uh, on my own. And so, um, my kids have led me to become friends with other parents and, and, uh, people that I, I might not normally have met. Um, but I do think that the handful of friendships that I have within the industry are irreplaceable and, and, and couldn't be couldn't be reproduced by, by someone outside of the industry for sure. I mean, uh, you know, and that, and that runs the gamut from like sitting around and talking about the, the minutia of some, you know, horrible comic that we read in the 1970s or something like that to just 
kind of knowing what the what the life is like, you know, the very the very specific yeah. life experience. Hmm. Yeah, how did without throwing anybody under the bus, family life affect your work process and and the work overall? Well, and obviously it's the core of the book. It yeah. is the 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 epiphany that's there, but we don't want to have a spoiler alert. Um but beyond that, you know, what did family life teach you, I, I guess? Well, um, the book before this one, Killing and Dying, uh, was made during uh, the, the, the span of my life that included the birth of both of my daughters. Um, so not only was it a time of extreme change for me, but it was a very hard time to be working from, <laughs> from home. Um, and you know, now that that experience has passed and I can sort of look back on it, I can see that it was, uh, the most challenging time for me as a cartoonist, but also, um, I think the most, uh, deeply inspired, inspired time for me, uh, the idea of, being transformed as a person by the experience of parenthood um, could only have a profound effect on me as an artist. And I think that some of the things that exist in that book and, and the new book um, wouldn't have come about if I was uh, still the same, the same person as I was back in, back in Berkeley years ago when I was living by myself. Um, so it's, it's uh, I mean, I think a lot of parents will talk about this. It's an interesting quandary that uh, the experience um, completely recharged me and in, inspired me uh, on, a, on a mental, psychological, artistic level, but also completely infringed upon my ability to execute <laughs> that, that inspiration <laughs> just because of time constraints and interruptions and, and, and noise and, and things like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a... It's a profound experience, but in, in several directions. Hmm. Did you find you had to become a better note taker as far as ideas, snippets of dialogue, et cetera, so you can save it for when you have a minute? Or is that something you were already a, a practitioner of? Uh, no, I was actually a, a good note taker prior to having children. And then... I, I had to become a good mental note taker because I didn't have a notebook with me. I didn't have a minute to grab a pencil and a pen when I'm chasing two kids around at the playground or something like that. <laughs> um, and so it really shifted the process into a in, intangible um, mental zone. You know, I used to work so much in advance of, of creating a comic on paper in various drafts. I would type things on the computer sometimes. I would use note cards. I would all these different steps. And, uh, you know, that just became less practical, uh, in recent years. And so I don't have the ability to have a sketchbook on hand at all times. And I can't stop everything that's happening when I get an idea. But what I do have more of is kind of mindless time. Like there's, um, a lot more time now where I'm standing in one place at a playground, pushing one of my kids on a swing or sitting next to them in the bathtub. Uh, you know, so I can't, I can't work on paper, but I, I can definitely work in my brain. And that's something that I've tried to really develop in recent years. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself doing more long form 200 page stuff going forward or heading back towards shorter comics? Mm, I, I think in a lot of ways, the, the, the market has really expressed a preference for, for books, you know, <laughs> yeah. for, for better or worse. I mean, I, I love little comics. Um, I love getting mini comics and single issue floppies as they're called by some people. But um, in general, there seems to be sort of this consensus that like, you know, books are preferable and, um, so I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think, um, I think the reality is that, you know, even if I do work in, in a shorter format that someone will want to eventually put it into book form. Um, 
Mm-hmm. That's that's been been the case for for a while now. Um, uh, so so I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I think unfortunately the last four or five months have not been <laughs> particularly conducive to to developing a next big ambitious uh, book project. You know, um, I, I I I sort of had a, a lesson in my mind from another cartoonist years ago who said like never go out on a promotional tour unless you know exactly what you're working on when you get home. Uh, and, um, you know, the tour was canceled and hand in hand with that, the, uh, the, the, the determination to figure out the next project also got canceled too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How has pandemic life been for you? What were the, beyond losing the tour, you know, how, how significantly has life been warped? Um, I think, uh, much less than, than for many other people. Um, we know a lot of people whose jobs and incomes, uh, were, you know, horribly affected by this, um, uh, to say nothing of the people whose health was affected by it. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, my day-to-day life was changed only by the fact that my kids were home all day. Um, uh, I would have been home all day anyway. Um, and, um, you know, so it, it, it certainly inhibited the amount of, of work I was able to get done. Um, my wife was able to maintain her job full time. So I was spending most of the days dealing with homeschooling and housekeeping and, and things like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, basically, um, from from a distance, my life probably wouldn't look that different. But in terms of what I was accomplishing career-wise, it was uh, a bit of a standstill. <laughs> yeah. Did you have any sense of um, figuring out things that, that mattered and didn't matter in terms of, boy, I used to really appreciate being able to go around the corner for X, Y, or Z, Um but especially in those those early days when we were sheltering in place, sure. has there been any sense of uh, kind of reevaluating? You sure? I mean, in those... in, in all yeah. all areas of life, I think. But um, you know, in in the context of of this book, it 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 definitely made me think fondly on a lot of the things that I'm grousing about in the book. Um, you know, when... the same way with trade shows, I, I was running in my running group with one of my pharmaceutical pals. And for all of the griping and bitching we used to do about having to fly to trade shows, be there for two or three days, fly up. Now we're like, oh, my God, wouldn't it be great? Yeah. <laughs> just just get to Newark, get on a plane, go to the show hotel for two days, yeah. come back. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, complaining about the tour. Yeah. I mean, I uh, w- really envisioned some sort of. um you know, when back when we were actually planning an extensive tour, I was going to be out on the road for a good chunk of the spring and the summer. Um, and uh, I was starting to envision kind of a, a Charlie Kaufman like scenario where I'm in, in a hotel room by myself uh, on the road promoting a book about being in hotel rooms by yourself and being alone and <laughs> getting humiliated. And I started to have the fear that the tour of this book would actually surpass the experiences that I was describing in it. And I'd sort of want to retract the book and, and, and add to it in real time or something like that. Um, and, uh, I was, I was dreading it. I, I was, I was totally dreading it. And, um, uh, you know, as, as the months have dragged on now, um, you know, there's a part of me that wouldn't mind, you know, at least, a few days of, uh, of touring. Yeah. Even doing a reading with only three people showing up and, and all those experiences we've been through. Yeah. If I got to go to a hotel room by myself and, you know, watch TV afterwards, that would be great. Yeah. Have you been in a comic shop or bookstore since this began? Uh, no, I've, um, I've picked up books, uh, in sort of a curbside situation, but I haven't been in yeah. to browse around anywhere yet. Yeah. So I've been wondering, I, I've, I went three months without setting foot in a building other than my house. So, mm-hmm. you know, I've managed to keep it really, really tight until the last month or two, but mm-hmm. um, 
yeah, I'm just sort of wondering what that's going to be like when we're actually in one of those places again. Yeah, yeah. Now, what do you miss about the uh, the floppies, the whole pamphlet format in terms of making them? Is oh, there, in terms uh, of making them? Yeah. Uh, uh, nothing. Nothing about making them. I, I yeah. miss. <laughs> I miss. I miss being a fan of them. I miss being a reader of them. Um, you know, for for ten years of my life in Berkeley, I had a weekly ritual of meeting up with Dan Klaus and Richard Sala for lunch, and then going to the comic book store and browsing and picking up the new things that had come out that week. Um, and I love that there were new things every week for me to, to look at. Um, and I love that format. I like reading letter columns and I liked, um, little editorials and things that kind of bookended the material, um, you know, a lot more cover designs to see. Um, so, you know, I, it, partly it's just nostalgia, but I, I really miss that whole experience. Um, uh, and, um, in terms of making them, no, I, I, I don't, I don't miss it at all. I wasn't sure if that format that, that, you know, putting together 24 pages or 32, you know, meant something to you in any, any, you know, inherent way, or if it was just, this is how I happen to make comics right now. Well, it's, 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 it was a formative experience for me. I mean, that's how, I mean, no matter what, I think of everything I do in relation to that now. So when I'm putting together a book like this, I'm thinking of like, this is a really fat comic book that I have to put together now. You know, I'm, <laughs> um, the, 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 the process is still fairly similar because I, I do all the design and, and a lot of the production work at home myself. And so, you know, since, uh, I mean, the technology has changed, but um, the, the, the final stages of, of whatever I produce, whether it's a, a book or, or, or a comic book, it's always the same. It's me scanning pages and, and looking at a computer screen and obsessively adjusting little things. And, you know, um, so th there's, there's not anything specific to making comic books that, that I feel has, has been taken away. Yeah. Understood. Do you dream of comic shops that don't exist? I do sometimes. Do you find um, your... Yeah. yeah I, I thought so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, not so much comic shops that don't exist, but comic shops that I, that did exist or that I went to in the past. Um, and the more surreal aspect is, and this is a very common experience, but the idea of being in that store and seeing with absolute clarity, some item that doesn't actually exist in the real world. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, uh, dreamed of your own work that doesn't exist? You know, things of yours that you saw from like beginning to end hmm. as a book or a, a comic? Because uh, for me, that saves so much labor <laughs> uh, instead of my actually ever producing anything. I, I just wait for those moments and, and feel just fine. But. I'm not sure about from beginning to end, but I've uh, I've definitely had weird experiences of um, like within a dream, opening a sketchbook of mine and very clearly seeing something on that page that until five minutes later I hadn't drawn yet. You know, I wake up and then I actually do execute it, but. Um, I've definitely had that experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when it, it comes to the new book, um, in some circumstances, you, you redact names basically to protect the douchey. Um, are there ones you've, you hemmed and hawed about as to whether you should include their name or, or did you always feel like you should err on the side of let's not either get this guy more pissed off or get his fans pissed mm -hmm. off at me. Yeah. I, that was probably, uh, the most exhausting, exhausting process of, of, of editing this book was, was making those calculations and those, those judgment calls. Um, and, uh, however much thought someone thinks I might've put into that, um, I put in more and I really, uh, <laughs> worried a lot about that. Um, even down to how much I was obscuring the names with the scratch, scratchy lines and, and, and things like that. Um, and, and whether thinking, someone could figure out from the length of it, how, who, who exactly, it was or, exactly yeah. that, 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 <laughs> that came up a lot. Um, and you know, I, I think the reason that it, and I hope that 
people will understand this, that the reason that it caused me so, such pain is because um, despite what it might seem like, I wasn't doing this book out of a sense of revenge. I, I, I didn't want to... Uh, it, it, it was more important to describe the experience to me and to show my sort of, in many cases, immature reaction to it rather than to, to, to bring, uh, you know, negative attention back to the, the other person in the story. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I think there's a lot of elements in the book that, um, could be read as like, I'm extremely bitter about it. And this was my revenge. But, um, you know, I think if there was something that I was genuinely bitter about and really wanted revenge, I don't think doing a lighthearted comic strip about it would really be the most effective route. <laughs> People think less rationally in this day and age, but I'm with you. Yeah. I, I get where you're coming from. I think Bob Fingerman still wants to punch me over a review I wrote in <laughs> 1997 or so, but mm. I, I still stand by that review in, in mm -hmm. fact, but that's, that's just me in those old comics journal days. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, uh, how's the reception been uh, from the advanced copies and some of the the cartooning peers? Has anybody gotten back to you either in terms of this isn't how it happened, or I don't look like that, or oh my god, you <laughs> captured everything that's humiliating about being a cartoonist? Um, a little bit of of everything. Um, you know, <laughs> when I was making this book, there was I I, I had this you know absolute. Um, I, I had no sense of, of, of who the audience would be for this book. I didn't know if it would resonate with uh, the general public at all. I didn't even know if my publisher would be interested in, in putting it out. I thought it was a little bit of a, a, a specific niche kind of project. But I never for a moment doubted that there was a group of, you know, five or ten friends of mine who... <laughs> Mm -hmm. would get a lot out of this book and would recognize things that no one else would. And I worked my ass off to put detail and references in this book just for those five or 10 people. And so um, when the first early advanced copies of the book arrived from overseas, uh, my publisher wanted me to compile a list of like, you know, oh, important reviewers or, or, influencers or people that would help promote the book. But at the top of my list were, were, were my main <laughs> cartoonist friends, because I, <laughs> I, I, that was the reaction that I was waiting for more than anything else. Um, and so that's been, that's been the biggest, uh, reward for me, like just getting a text message from someone saying like, Oh, I just went back and I, how did you remember that thing? Or where did you find a reference photo <laughs> for, for that guy or, or something like that? Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, enough time has passed that I'd forgotten that I put them in the book. And then so when I hear from someone else that they spotted it, it's like very, uh, very satisfying for me. <laughs> nice. I can imagine Drawn and Quarterly not being thrilled when they see a list of basically advanced copies going to people with no social media presence <laughs> yeah, <right>. whatsoever. Exactly. <laughs> That's like, great. They can influence each other. Fantastic. Exactly. Yeah, do you find yourself... Um, you know, do you have much of a, a social media consumption and or no, production? No, no. Vibe? Uh, so I didn't more, think so. More production than consumption, of course. Um, I had really no interest in it in, in general. Um, and, and almost as a, as a stance avoided it for a long time. But, um, when killing and dying was about to come out, uh, I got a little bit of an intervention. I think my, my publisher and there were a couple publicists who were working on the book at the same time. They all kind of um, sat me down and said, you know, we don't need you to be on all the platforms, but can you pick one and can you, you know, we'll, we'll guide you through it or something, but it's just going to be important to be able to, when you're on tour to be able to say the event is canceled or we're moving it to a different place or something like that. And so that's what got me uh, started on Instagram. Hmm. Anything you've found in terms of either that as a form, the audience interaction, you know, anything about it that's that's struck you as interesting in a way that's that's fed into your work or just your mindset towards uh, uh, how doomed we all are? <laughs> no, no, neither. I, I, <laughs> I, I actually am 
totally content with the, the, the level of interaction and obligation that, that, Insta that I've arrived at with, with Instagram. I know other people who are totally immersed in the world of Twitter and Facebook, and they talk about these experiences almost like kind of emotional roller coasters where they get into wars with people or they get their feelings really hurt or all these um, emotional components. And, and uh, I have, have somehow struck a nice balance where I can you know, post images and answer questions sometimes if necessary. And I've, you know, I, I'll admit that I've, I've, I've met some, some, some great people that, um, you know, people whose work I admired and I was excited to get to know and, uh, things like that. But, um, I, I've, I, I don't, I don't think I would stick with it if it was that, that kind of roller coaster that other people have described. Yeah. Some people live for that. And I just, I don't get it. I mean, yeah. I had one, Twitter thing go viral, uh, a joke I, I once did. And I thought, oh, that's very nice. Mm -hmm. I am not going to ever chase this. You know, this, this is not a, a aspiration to, oh, I need to keep getting that, that juice. It was a nice little dopamine hit, but yeah, yeah I, I, you find satisfaction in other ways, mm -hmm. I, I suppose. Um, it, tell me about your, your writing influences since we've never gotten to that. And you've talked about your art being all of these pastiches of everybody who's influenced you on that end. When it comes to writing both comics and prose writing, you know, do you find yourself, do you find significant influences or do you, do you find yourself still kind of searching around among uh, various writers? Um, I think that I was so burned by the experience of um, having influence be such a, a topic uh, of conversation related to my, to my artwork that um, it's sort of, uh, I think, for good and bad, um, steered me away from actively seeking out influence in, in especially in, in terms of writing. Um, uh, you know, I, I I know enough about myself that I can very easily uh, fall under the sway of an artist I admire, and then suddenly everything I'm doing is is a pale imitation of of their sure. work. And so I, I think I've tried to sort of, eh, I, I won't say I cl have closed the door to that, but I, I've put up a good screen door and, uh, you know, I think, I think influence probably seeps through unconsciously no matter what I do, but, you know, I don't want to have that experience of, you know, sitting down and thinking like, well, how does Cormac McCarthy write a book? Okay. Let me write a story like Cormac McCarthy or something like that, you know, which is, exactly what I did with, with comics many times over the years. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself getting accused of that nonetheless? I assume with the sort of, we'll say minimalist vibe for some of your work, everybody will throw Raymond Carver because that's the mm -hmm. easiest name to, to throw out there. But, sure. um, you know, I guess basically the, the bigger question, who do you read, you know, both in prose and in comics, who do you, well, comics, you're going to, who do you read in prose? I guess we'll, <laughs> we'll just go there. Um, it's, 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 uh, really all over the place. I mean, um, uh, you know, it kind of, I go through, through phases of course. And, um, you know, I, uh, right now I'm in the middle of two big, uh, kind of dark books. I'm reading, um, the new novel by Otessa Moshfeg called Death in Her Hands. And I'm also reading mm -hmm. Ant Kind by Charlie Kaufman, which is a 700, both... 700 page book or something. Yeah, big books. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, with, with the first author, I've, I've read everything else she's done. So I'm sort of uh, completing, you know, I'm sticking with a, a tradition, but, you know, Charlie Kaufman's never wrote, <laughs> wrote a book before. So this is a first time experience. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you want to get into comics, but I just got a comic in the mail sure. yesterday uh, called, I think it's called Portrait of a Drunk. Uh, and um, it's, 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 it's very, it's very impressive. It's sort of um, exciting to me to, to see uh, work that pushes the, 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 the boundaries of what I'm used to in comics and yet still very clearly and compellingly tells a story and, and has jokes and, and, and 
works as just a beautiful piece of art too. Yeah, do you find yourself um, able to have sort of uh, transformative reading experiences? Do you find yourself able to have your mind blown by a comic nowadays? Um, yeah, of course. I um, definitely. I mean, it's it's uh, a rarer occurrence than it was when I was younger. Um, sure. Either because the 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 artists that I like have become less prolific, or or my mind has more resistance to being blown. I don't know, but um, it, it's still possible. I mean, if, if, if one of my favorite artists comes out with a new book, um, you know, there's never a sense of disappointment. Uh, these, it's, it's, it's incredible that, that uh, people that I latched onto as, as favorite artists when I was a teenager have continued uh, with a, with a, amazing level of, of, of quality. And so, um, if, if any of those people puts out a new book, it's going to blow my mind. And, you know, uh, I love the experience of, of finding new work that isn't familiar to me. So, um, that, that happens sometimes. I mean, I don't have that weekly ritual anymore of, of going to the comic yeah. book store. Um, there's not even, a comic store very close to where I live. I mean, there used to be, but there isn't anymore. So, um, I have sort of somewhat limited access now. And, um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of, um, sometimes, uh, limited to what comes in the mail or what, what other people recommend to me or something like that. So, um, I, I, I don't always have that same experience of just stumbling upon something totally cold on my own. Understood. I, I just happened to have that experience very recently, and it it was striking in terms of, oh my god, I haven't had like that level of holy shit. I didn't know this was out there, you know, with, in, with, in many many years. With a comic, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I was I was sort of mind blown. He'll get embarrassed if I talk about it, but it was uh, E. S. Glenn or Everett Glenn, my my pod guest from last week, hmm. had a twenty pager in the new issue of Now, and I was just. Wow, mm. that's a really great comics experience, and I was not expecting this at all. So, oh, that's great! Um, I'll have to look for that. Yeah, yeah, I'll send you. Yeah, I'll send you some info about it. Eric great. Reynolds can can hook you up over at uh, at Fanta. Great. Um, kids, kids show any interest in comics, and particularly in your comics. I mean, your kids. Um, uh, yeah. Um, any? <laughs> yes. Um, my older daughter, who's ten is definitely a comics fan. She's definitely drawn to things that are in that format more than anything else. If there's, you know, two books that she knows nothing about side by side and one is prose and one is comics, she's going to go right to the comics. Um, she's uh, at various points been a fairly obsessive cartoonist herself. Um, I think at this point she's probably produced more pages of comics <laughs> than I have. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and she has her favorite artist. I mean, she's a huge fan of, um, of Raina Telgemeier, who, uh, has some books from Scholastic that are, that are, you know, uh, if you're, if you're in the right age group or if you have kids, they're, they're, they're omnipresent. Um, and, uh, and Tom Spurgeon had first turned me on to her cause there was the, oh, Gil, this is Raina. Who's also the most successful person in comics. That's right. Who, Everybody kind of, well, that's not comics, comics, but in fact is comics. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, and autobiographical comics too. That's, um, you know, she has, yeah. she has some fiction books, but, uh, the, the ones that my daughter loves the most are, are very, very clearly autobiographical cartooning. Mm -hmm. Now is your current book a way of trying to dissuade them from going into the family business <laughs> or, or not? <laughs> Uh, no, that, that would be, a you know, more strategic than I'm, than I'm capable of, I think. Um, and I think it would also, uh, afford me more power over my children than, than I'm capable of. Um, uh, no, I, I, you know, I think I, I, in, in the book I talk about that I wouldn't necessarily recommend that they, they live their life the way I did. Um, but I certainly wouldn't, uh, dissuade them from, from a similar career. I, 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 I'd say there's about a 0% chance of that happening, but, uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't <laughs> dissuade them for sure. 
Now, last real question. The the book does sort of come to this culmination as to the question of whether it was a worthwhile pursuit mm -hmm. in terms of, of you being a, a cartoonist. Do you have that that alternate reality? Do you think about, you know, what else you could have put those hours into? Oh, yeah. Or has it always been this sort of ambiguous something else? Uh, yeah. No. And, um, you know, I think sometimes when I get that question, I think that there's sort of an implication like I had some very definite definite uh, alternate career in mind, like that I'm going to say like, well, I would be a professional soccer player or something like that. But um, it, it's, it's nothing about an alternative career, but it's more about having lived a fuller life with more human interaction and more, uh, more experience, more adventure. Um, uh, and so I think the alternate, the alternate life is one where I have a very boring job, you know, something that has a predictable hours with, a, a vacation slots on the calendar every year and, um, steady paycheck that allows me to be when I'm off the clock, totally present with my family and to be able to take trips and not be worrying about the, 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 the book that I'm halfway through back at home. Um, hmm. yeah. But without art. Say that again. Huh. Without art. Without. I mean, you know, ha having that life, but not having that, that expression that you have. Right. <sighs> yeah. The last thing I want to ask you, and I, I should have prepared you and you could tell me if it's too weird a question or something you can't think of right now. Hmm. Can you tell me a story about Richard Sala? Hmm. We corresponded once and mm -hmm. he had to beg off of recording with me because of his anxiety and, yeah. and everything. And I took no for an answer. And he died a few months ago. And yeah. seeing him just make an appearance in, in your new book, I thought I would just love to hear, you know, a story about Richard uh, from, from your your memory of that era. Is yeah. there anything that, that jumps to mind? Well, he was Richard was definitely one of that group of people who I was talking about, who I envisioned as being the audience for this book. Um, and mm. I think, uh, I, I, you know, a lot of people envision their book, uh, being on a bestseller list or, or seeing someone on the subway reading it. But really when I was making this book, I was thinking about, uh, Dan and Richard, sitting in the diner that we used to go to in Oakland and talking about it. That was really my, my fantasy and my, and my motivation. And so it, it is, um, hard for me to not, to know that, 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 that won't, that won't happen. Um, um, in terms of stories about him, I mean, it's, uh, there's, there's so many, I don't, I don't even know where to begin, but I, I think one, one thing that I, I thought of a lot, um, when, when he died, uh, was the idea that, uh, he always treated me as, as a peer. Uh, and you know, um, he was so self-deprecating and so, uh, so, so neurotic about his own work. And, uh, that, that I, I you know, I, I, I am just so in awe of, of, of his humility that, that, that when we met, you know, he was, an established artist who had, uh, had animation on MTV and had illustrated for every magazine in the world and was published in raw. And, you know, he acted like he was excited to meet me, this, this teenager who was putting out little, little pamphlets and, um, you know, and that, that, uh, encouragement from him, whether he meant it that way or not continued, for as, for as long as I knew him. And I, you know, I, to me, I, I think I'll always be, um, attracted to people like that, who, who have achieved so much, uh, who, who are at the top of their game in some ways who could by every right be, uh, an arrogant snob and they are just completely down on themselves. They are just completely, uh, alienated. They think that their work <laughs> is terrible. Um, yeah. you know, uh, his, his, one of his constant 
refrains was I can't win. So just any anything that would happen, he'd say it was it's it's almost it was almost reassuring in a way that for him, <laughs> if something went bad, then it was status quo. Uh, you know, all is right in the world because <laughs> something went wrong for me. Yeah. Um, and so that, 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 there's just so many incidents like that, and we we spent mm-hmm. so many uh, so many hours together just talking and 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 joking around and. Um, you know, uh, I just, I really, uh, appreciate and miss, uh, that personality. Um, cause it's, it's increasingly rare in this world. I gotta say uh, the, the culture has gotten a lot more, um, arrogant. And, uh, I, I think, I think it's, it's sad to, to have one less person like that. Yeah. I'm, thank you. I'm, I'm bummed that I took no for an answer, but when I look back at what he wrote when he said no, I understood everything. Mm-hmm. Like I got all of the anxiety, all of the, oh dear, please don't put me in this position. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I understood that this was a guy who let the work speak for him, but still didn't believe, believe in, in the work, or at least, you know, believe that he was somehow getting away with something. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I, 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 a, I admire that. Artist. I admire that too. I, 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 you know, it's hypocritical that I'm I'm saying this as I as I talk on a podcast, but I, I I do really admire the idea that he was an artist and that he let the art speak for itself, and um, as much as possible wanted the attention off of him. Mm-hmm. Well, I won't take up any more of your time or force any more attention on you, <laughs> Adrian. Thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Thanks, Gil. It was an honor. And that was Adrian Tomina. His new book is The Loneliness of the Long Distance Cartoonist from Drawn and Quarterly. And you can find it at your favorite bookstores and maybe comic shops. It came out today, again, July 21st, 2020 for you time travelers. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot, as you can tell from our, our conversation, both for the, the personal story it conveys as, as well as how it chronicles changes in cartooning over 25 years and the public acceptance of comics and uh and some of the personalities who adrian brings into the the conversation so go read it the loneliness of the long distance cartoonist now adrian's doing a pretty hardcore virtual book tour starting today with people like or with interviews with people like seth randall park michael sheen and wyatt senak and you can find all those dates on his site adrian-tomina.com that's A D R I A N dash T O M I N E dot com. He's also on Twitter. Or sorry, he's also on Instagram as Adrian Tomina, all one word. And there'll be links to all of this in the show notes for this episode. Now, in the before time, uh, now is when I would mention my Patreon and PayPal, but we're living in a different world now. So, um, I'm doing just fine financially. My job is pretty stable. Um, so if you can spare anything, uh, I don't need your money. I would like an occasional email or a letter or something, but, um, what you should do is go find the Patreons, GoFundMes, Kickstarters, Indiegogos, whatever for the artists and writers you like and show them some support. Uh, if you're not comfortable giving to individuals, there are plenty of worthwhile charities out there like local food banks, freedom funds, and, um, well, we are in crisis mode as a country uh, on numerous fronts. And if you're in a position to help people, all I can ask is that you help them. As far as Patreons, PayPals, and all that stuff go, um, I will say that I send out copies of my very first zine, Haiku for Business Travelers, to supporters of the show, as well as some past guests. Uh, if you want a copy of it, it's free. Just drop me a line or visit haiku for business travelers dot com and you'll see how to hit me up that way. If you want, you can kick in a few bucks for postage and production, but um like I said, I'm doing okay with my job, so um this is just me sharing my art, such as it is. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y 
the number 4, TH. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 